Good evening, everyone. So welcome back to our weekly study on types and shadows. This might come in handy in a little bit. So once again, the, the Word of God contains a depth and breadth that continually displays the amazing wisdom of God. Our Lord prefigured people and concepts in the Old Testament that are types and shadows of those that would come about in the New Testament. We call the people or concepts that were being shadowed the antitype or the real thing. In the weeks prior to the gospel meeting, we looked at several people who were types or shadows of Christ. We looked at how Melchizedek was a type for Jesus, the antitype, as both high priest and king forever, as Christ is our high priest and king forever. We looked at how Isaac was a type for Jesus, the antitype, as Abraham's only son, and the willingness of Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, as Christ was God's only son, and the Lord allowed Christ to be sacrificed on the cross for us. We looked at how Joseph was a type to Jesus, the antitype, as Joseph was hated by his brothers, tempted repeatedly, and provided bread to all nations, as Christ, the antitype, was hated by his brethren, tempted repeatedly by the devil, and the Jewish leaders, and is the bread of life. And then the last week before the gospel meeting, we looked at how Moses was a type to Jesus. As Moses went 40 days without food or water in the presence of the Lord, he received credit for controlling the wind and the sea and the parting of the Red Sea, and he instituted the Passover feast at the direction of God. And then compared to Christ, who went 40 days without food while being tempted by the devil in the wilderness, how he controlled the winds and the sea as deity, and he instituted the Lord's Supper. Tonight we'll begin looking at concepts rather than people from the Old Testament, and how these concepts foreshadowed concepts and people detailed in the New Testament. We will see that, the under, that understanding the concepts from the Old Testament helps us to more fully understand the concepts and people taught in the New Testament. Before we begin, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Lord, we thank you for this glorious day that you have given us, the changing of the seasons that we can feel all around us, that we can see in the, in the changing of the leaves. We know this is from you. You have created this world. You have created the seasons, and we were able to see the, the glory of your creation. We pray that you will be with us this evening as we study from your word. We pray that all that we speak will be in accordance with thy will. We pray that if we do err, that we will be made known of it, that we may be able to correct ourselves and to rightly derive your word. We pray that we'll be with us always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I don't need this. Oh, excellent. Okay. So the first question in the book was, what was the importance of circumcision in the Old Testament? With a reference from Genesis 17, 9 through 14. Genesis 17, 9 through 14 says, And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of the foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So we see here that every male child was to be circumcised in the flesh of their foreskin on the eighth day. And that the circumcision was necessary for the descendants and also any males that were purchased and their descendants. So what was the importance of this circumcision? 
sign of the covenant. Absolutely. Sign of the covenant. Um, so this, this covenant between God and Abraham, and by extension, as the circumcision was through the generations, that sign was to, was to carry through those generations. Okay. Next question was, what blessings were received due to circumcision? References Joshua 5. One through nine. Joshua five, one through nine. So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over that their heart melted. And there was no spirit in them any longer because the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt, who were males, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which, their, which the Lord had sworn to their fathers and that he would give us a land flowing with milk and honey. Then Joshua circumcised their sons whom he raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. So it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore the name of this place is called Gilgal to this day. So we see that, the, that God dried up the the Jordan River to allow the Israelites to cross over. And when word spread of how God had dried up the river, it caused a state of depression in the Amorites and the Canaanites. As we continue to read past the first verse, we realize that the majority of the Israelites had not been circumcised while they were in the wilderness for those 40 years. Joshua was commanded to make flint knives in order to circumcise all the males. And when he had finished, and they had healed, the Lord told Joshua that he had now removed the reproach of Egypt from them. So what blessings were received by this circumcision? Well, it seems to make sense that, uh, you know, the sign of the covenant would be necessary in order to, I mean, that was something they were bound to keep before God would actually allow them to take the, the land that he promised that was part of that covenant. So it's, you know, it just seemed reasonable that they would need to do their part and maintain that covenant, uh, which was through circumcision. Uh, they hadn't taken Jericho yet. They hadn't taken the land yet. It was before all this happened. So I think it was them getting right with God in that covenant before he actually uh, you know, gave them the, the land. And, the, and, he had, and he, he did something for them even before they were circumcised. You know, by drying up the Jordan so they could, they could cross... I mean, he gave them that, and then, you know, again, how many times d does the Lord do these incredible miracles for these people? So often, then they they turn away from him right away. But this time, they're going to go. They're going to go to Jericho next. And now, based on what they just saw and what they had, now it's going to be a little bit different story than sometimes in the past. Anyone else? Absolutely, and we're actually going to talk about that more in detail next week. Um, next week's topic being bondage. Um, you know, absolutely that that reproach of Egypt, um, right? They're they're now free, and and really that that time they spent in the wilderness, they were still while they weren't necessarily slaves during that point. 
they were they were still pretty much in a slave like condition they weren't they didn't have that the true freedom they weren't able to go into the promised land um they were they were certainly being taken care of but it was not a it, it was not a um fruitful um life at that time anything else nope. it's just interesting that this first covenant or this covenant in genesis 17 was a long time before Egypt, and uh, he tells them then they're going to have the land of canaan and that they would be his possession and this land would be their possession so this was a, a foretelling of things to come even though it had this physical sign to represent them as his people. Uh, they had to again be his people before they get the land. Absolutely. So the next question is, how did the Jews of the first century understand circumcision? We look over at Acts, the 10th chapter. Acts 10, verses 44 through 46. It says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then Peter answered, so what did the Jews of the first century understand about circumcision? Well, it's still a big deal for them. And, uh, you know, you look at Acts 15, uh, 1 and 2 with the Jewish Christians there. You know, that's where that dispute arose uh, with respect to the Gentiles. Unless you're circumcised, you, know, you can't be saved. So uh, circumcision, circumcision continued to be, you know, very important to the, to the Jewish uh, and the Jewish people. And... Um, so, you know, it had not gone away with the uh, importance. Anyone else? Well, you can kind of uh, understand why it would have been a stumbling block is to a certain degree. Uh, the way that the gospel was rolled out, it was rolled out to the Jews first. And so this is their first <coughs> encounter with those that are allowed to be saved under this new covenant, too. Absolutely. Um, and, I, and I think... I think to a, a certain extent, the, the Jews of the first century overemphasized circumcision. It was almost as if that was the end all. Kind of like in, the, in the, today's world, the once saved, always saved philosophy. It was almost as if they thought that way of circumcision. You know, once they were circumcised at eight days old, that was it. They were, they were saved. They were they were God's chosen people, and that's all that there was, and, you know, no, no need for the Gentiles anyway. Um, so why was the example, goes to what Stephen was saying, why was the example of the Holy Spirit falling on Cornelius and his household included in the written word? Well, the entire chapter in Acts chapter 10, um, you know, you just see all of these... Uh, Miracles taking place, Peter having a vision. It took so much, the Holy Spirit speaking to Peter, and just to get to the house of Cornelius. So that was, uh, I think that was a sign for the Jews, those Jewish believers, to see that uh, Gentiles can be accepted. Uh, they certainly weren't saved at that point. Uh, they still needed to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. But it just took so much for Peter to get to the house. And even when he got to the house, he didn't want to be there. Uh, so all of these things were to help them to see you know, this is a kingdom for Jews and Gentiles. What he said. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, when we were studying Isaiah, it was interesting because the Jews, their connection to God was always a question. Circumcision, the temple. As long as the temple was standing, we're okay. We're the people of God. We're taking care of it. As long as we're circumcised, we're the people of God. And what you're going to go on probably to talk about Romans too is that it's, it's not the circumcision of the flesh that we all are circumcised as children of the children of God. It's a spiritual circumcision, not the flesh that only matter, but they couldn't get over it. Absolutely. Well, and you know, like Ben brought up in Acts 15, you know, Peter refers back to this event. This was a pivotal 
proof for him to use in his arguments that he made to show the others that were there in Jerusalem that circumcision wasn't necessary. So it was a useful example, too. Well, I, I, I think I, I still think the, the biggest was just it's for the Gentiles, too. You know, it's for all men. And verse 47 has always been sort of in my twisted mind a little humorous. When, you know, Peter says, considering what, this is my translation, considering what we've just seen and, and these miracles, I'm not going to not let these people be baptized. How about you? No. <laughs> you know, with, with all that's taken place, it's clear to me that these people are worthy of uh, having the gospel presented to them and accepting them, accepting it and being full-fledged brethren. How many times did we see Christ perform a miracle on the Sabbath in the name of the Lord? And the only thing that the Jewish leaders could concentrate on was that he did this on the Sabbath, not the fact that he did it in the name of the Lord. So clearly he had to be doing it on behalf of the Lord. Um, here, Peter is at least recognizing that and saying, like, okay, you're right. Baptism. You already have it in your um, in the workbook, but it is interesting too just how often circumcision is discussed in the New Testament uh, Acts 16 uh, Galatians chapter 2 um, Acts chapter 11 the response of the Jewish brethren in verse 3 uh, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them so you know this was a this was a big deal um, in helping them to understand uh, who they who they were and are in Christ um, how all that Anyone else? Well, Stephen invoked circumcision too. I mean, he slapped them around enough in Acts chapter 7. He gets to verse 51 and he pulls Leviticus out and calls them uncircumcised in heart and ears. They had had it at that point. That would, I mean, you may as well just call them a Gentile. Like, you know, there are words that we would call somebody today, whether you're, you're, well, you're a, a Nazi or you're a racist or things like that. That was. That was the biggest slap in the face that you could give to the Jew. Agreed. Okay. So what is the purpose of us understanding circumcision? We'll look at Colossians 2. Colossians 2, verses 8 through 17. It says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the wor world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. In him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So Paul is, is speaking to the Gentile Christians in this letter, and he begins by warning them about those who will attempt to cheat them of eternal life by teaching things that are not according to Christ. Verse 8, he talks about philosophy and empty deceit, teaching according to man's traditions, and teaching what the world thinks of as wisdom. None of these teachings are in accordance with the teachings of Christ. Clearly, any teaching that is contrary to the teachings of Christ is harmful and illegitimate. Paul is warning these brethren to avoid these vain teachings. 
verses 11 and 12, Paul tells the brethren that they were circumcised, they were circumcised without hands. Now, how can one be circumcised without hands? You can't physically, but spiritually you can. And that's, that's his example, I believe, is putting off that body of sins. It's like cutting off the force of it, putting it off. Yeah, the, the circumcision discussed here is, is certainly spiritual rather than physical. We become circumcised spiritually when we repent from our sinful life and are buried with him, Christ, in baptism. We are raised from our sinful life just as God raised Christ from the dead. Verse 13, Paul further explains how when we were dead to sin, we were thinking in the flesh, with the flesh, and were therefore uncircumcised. However, when we repent and are baptized, God forgives us of our sins. Verse 14. It refer- the, the last phrase in it, in verse 14, is he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. What is this verse, this, this phrase referring to? Jesus yeah, but what, what's being nailed to the cross? The old law? talks about the handwriting of requirements, referring to the Mosaic Law, and the, the reference to it being contrary. In verse 14, it says, you know, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, the Mosaic Law, which was contrary to us. Here he's, he's talking about the burdensome nature of the Mosaic Law. There were so many ordinances and feasts and holy days and sacrifices and it was just, it was burdensome in what they had to do. However, the death of Christ ended the requirements of the Mosaic Law, and these ordinances and laws were nailed to the cross when he was nailed to the cross. Verse 16, Paul repeats that message that he wrote in verse 8, this time with a little bit more specificity, talking about those who are trying to judge them or condemn them by what they eat, what they drink, whether or not they participate in the festival or because of the, the phase of the moon or the Sabbaths, all of which were important under the Mosaic Law. In verse 17, it states the true purpose of the laws concerning food and drink and festivals, etc. Those laws served as a shadow of things to come. Now, what were they a shadow of? What were the... In verse 17, Verse 16, where it's talking about the food and the drink and the festival, the new moon, the Sabbath, says it's, it's a shadow of things to come. What is it a shadow of? What's the antitype? What's the substance? It's right there in the verse, right? I just stopped a little short. Yeah, it's Christ. You know, we, we, spent, we spent several weeks looking at people who were types to Christ the antitype. And then sometimes I think we, we think, oh, if it's a concept, if it's circumcision, it ha- must be related to some concept. No, this is related to Christ. Uh, it, it, Christ is still the, the antitype. He's still the substance, uh, even when it comes to circumcision. The, the burdensome laws that, that Paul noted in verse 14, they were necessary to lead us to the gospel, to lead us to Christ. In like manner, the, the physical circumcision of the covenant with Abraham is a shadow of the true and substantive circumcision. Now it's a concept, the circumcision that we have spiritually. So we have that, that circ, you know, the, those festivals were the shadow for Christ. The circumcision, that physical circumcision that was required, that was a shadow of the spiritual circumcision that they were supposed to have also, but we are certainly have to have. Comments? Oh, there's something powerful there in verse, uh, uh, verse 12 again. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith and the working of God, you know, seeing God at work, uh, you know, cutting away, taking away our sins. Is this a powerful thing for us to, uh, to think about and to help, people, help other people to see? Necessity of baptism. God is 
wall. So how should the Jews have understood circumcision? Let's look at Deuteronomy 10. Deuteronomy 10, 16 through 21. It says, Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. Verse 21, he is your praise, he, he is your God, who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. So what does this passage tell us about circumcision? Even under the period of the Mosaic law. In Romans 2, 25 through 29. Romans 2, 25 through 29. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, Will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So what is Paul emphasizing here in, about circumcision in this passage? There's an obedience factor to being uh, a child of God, regardless of the uh, period of time. That's been true from the beginning. Absolutely. The, the obedience is... is is so important. Um, you know, it, by breaking the law, they may as well not have been circumcised in the first place because they're not truly circumcised. Uh, their heart is not circumcised. And then Psalm 37. Psalm 37, 28 to 31. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart, and none of his steps shall slide. Again, talking about obedience, the, the righteous will keep the law of God in their hearts, and the Lord has promised many blessings to those who obey him and continually seek after him. By keeping his word in our hearts, we will never waver as we walk. Any other comments on these passages? Due to time, we are going to I think move up to Passover. Well, let's move up to Passover. So 
So our first passage is Exodus 12. Exodus 12, 1 through 20. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of their houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on, the, on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until the morning, and what remains of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So, shall, so you shall eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on this night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day sh shall be to you a memorial. And you shall keep it as a feast for the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. And on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat that only must, may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this same day I have, I have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. So the Israelites were to select a lamb on the 10th day of the month. That lamb was supposed to be without blemish, without spot. It was a male of the first year. They were supposed to keep it till the 14th day. And at twilight, the whole assembly would all kill the lamb at the same time, at twilight. They were to take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and on the lintel above the door. Then they were supposed to roast the lamb and, with fire and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They were to have no leftovers. If they had any leftovers in the morning, they were supposed to burn it. The Lord even gave instructions on how they were supposed to be dressed, with their belt on, their sandals on, and the staff in their hand, ready to move. And they were supposed to eat it with haste. So it wasn't something to ponder over as you, as you discuss your day. The Lord would then pass through Egypt, killing all the firstborn of both man and beast, of anyone who did not have the blood on their doorposts and lintel. And then during this seven-day period, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, they were supposed to eat only unleavened bread in their houses. And not only were they supposed to only eat le unleavened bread, they had to remove any leavening agent from their houses. They couldn't even have it in their houses. What, what can we learn from those instructions? What... what we know what it meant to the Israelites here in Egypt. 
What, is, what does it tell us? Does it tell us anything? What would happen to a person if they did have some leavened bread during that seven days? They were cut off from the people, right? They were, yeah, they, they were going to be cut off. It, it wasn't just, uh, hey, try again. They were cut off from the people. Um, what would have happened if, if they wouldn't have put the blood on the doorposts or on the lintel? A man and beast. What would happen if they had boiled the lamb instead of roasting it? They'd be cut off. They would have probably lost their firstborn. God means what he says, Right? We understand that. It isn't, this isn't just about them leaving Egypt. It's about listening to the instructions of God and following them. Let's look over at 1 Corinthians 5. First Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8. It says, Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So how is the Passover written about in Exodus 20, or excuse me, Exodus 12, how is that a type for Christ, the antitype? The idea of repentance is not kind of sort of, you know, I'll eliminate a couple of things, but I'm just going to keep this around. You know, a little arsenic is okay. It's about cleansing every bit of that. Because if you don't, you're not fully repentant. We sing the song, did you repent? Fully repent. It's complete 180 degrees, not anything less. And he follows that up with, Cleansing out that old leaven, and getting all that completely out, turning yourself completely over, completely turning it. It's a complete. It's, I mean, the, the languages can't be any more clear. So if you had black mold in your house, I, I say that because we've all heard how horrible it is, and I see these houses that were being built while it was pouring rain every day, and I don't know how they don't get black mold at some point. But if your house has black mold, and you hire someone to come in and, and take care of that. And they remove 99% of it. Nobody in here is happy about that, are they? Right? That little 1% that you, you probably can't even find. It's probably buried behind some wall somewhere underneath some, some stuff in the attic. It's going to grow, isn't it? It's going to grow back. We do have to completely purge that old leaven. We have to purge that unrighteousness out of us. And the, the, those Passover instructions about the, especially that unleavened bread, it was, it was telling them exactly what to do. And then Christ, you know, talks about unleavened bread of pure and sincerity and truth. You know, that, that leavened bread, that has some bad agents in it.
absolutely. Um, let's look over back at Exodus 12. This time, verses 43 through 45. It says, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it, but every man's servant who is bought with money, when you, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. Then also 1 Corinthians 3. First Corinthians three twelve through fifteen it says, "Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire." So that, that account in Exodus, you know, the word of the Lord comes to pass. When he says he will do something, it will be done. Now, fortunately, the Israelites obeyed his words and followed the directions given to them. We don't read of any Israelites suffering loss. This passage in 1 Corinthians, now while it's not related directly to the Passover, it's still an example of how the Lord acts. Our works and actions will be tested by the Lord. If our works are proper, we will receive a reward. The Israelites witnessed a physical outcome to the words of God by being spared from the death on that night. We will witness a spiritual outcome to the words of God with eternal life. I want to, yes. And sometimes we may not understand why he's directing us one way. Don't worry about it, right? Just follow. Um, one last, the, the Passover lamb, what Stephen was referring to earlier. Let's look over at um, Exodus 12, 3 through 10. We already, we already read this account. Um, this Passover lamb was you know, a lamb without blemish, a male of the first year. Um, if we look at then... Knowing what we know about that Passover lamb, if we look over at 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, 17 through 25, it says, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but uncorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flowers fall away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So again, Christ is that lamb without blemish, without spot. The, the type was the Passover lamb, which, which did save those, the Jews, the Israelites, 
from being killed on that, that night. But Christ, his blood, because he was without blemish, because he was without spot, he is our antitype because his blood provides, redeems us from our transgressions. Thank you, everyone. Next week, we'll pick up on the next section, which is bondage.